You can tell this is an average uh, extra dense cataract with a posterior subcapsular aspect to it. Um, I love the signature system. Now, one of the little tricks I have is back when I was using the Duet system, I learned that you use a side port incision made with an MVR blade. So here we are, we're putting in some intracameral dilation that includes intracameral lidocaine, and then we're going to fill the anterior chamber with endocoat. And what we're trying to do is get a pretty reasonable fill, but not overfill. Now, again, the signature system is delightful because it allows you to work through a 2.2 or a 2.4 millimeter uh, incision. Depending upon my mood, I will either make a three-plane incision. In other words, I'll start with a limbus space groove, or I'll start right here. I'll just do a single-plane single, single plane incision with the 2.2 millimeter keratome. And once inside the eye, we're going to go ahead and do a capsulotomy. So a continuous tear capsular rexus under this, uh, these conditions can be challenging. So if the case is extra dense as this one is and the red reflex is exceptionally poor, you will definitely want to consider tripan blue to help you stain. But there is just enough differentiation of the surface features here that I am able to perform the continuous tear capsulotomy without staining the anterior capsule. Now, as I was alluding to, the 2.2 or 2.4 millimeter system with Abbott Medical Optic Signature works tremendously well, primarily because of fusion fluidics. And what this gives us is it gives us Ellipse FX, which is a fascinating modality for cataract removal. You have the combined transversal element, which is moving the tip side to side, along with longitudinal movement all in one blended action. So you have the advantage of a non-traditional longitudinal, non -traditional longitudinal phaco emulsification system with longitudinal. So longitudinal is actually going to pump the material out of the aperture of the needle, which allows the next bite with transversal to gain the next access. So we're rotating the nucleus just enough to have excursion. In this case, I'm using a straight needle. Now, honestly, I didn't use a straight needle until I'm completing a study. Now, there I actually oriented the irrigation sleeve. One of the things I observe very frequently, even with doctors at the podium, is that they will not have the uh, orientation of the irrigation sleeve correct, and I really don't like to have the irrigation pointed straight at the corneal endothelium. So, of course, I'm using uh, Perrier for my irrigating solution today. So we get a couple of bubbles. We're going to get rid of those. The power of transversal is amazing. So this is the Dewey radius tip. It's a 700 micron needle with a 21 gauge internal diameter. So it's beneficially uh, a smaller needle. The outside of the needle is functionally a 22 gauge. The inside of the needle is functionally a 21 gauge. So they have the advantage of preserving the smaller incision with the benefits of having the larger internal diameter fluidics. So as I'm impaling with the straight needle, I am going bevel down. And I find it really has been kind of an interesting study because you really cannot push the needle into a cataract that, this, that is this dense past the end of the infusion sleeve. So I was actually working with a doctor today in a wet lab who was having issues, and I really had to convince her that you can really push the needle into a denser cataract without worrying about that needle going all the way through. So with the transversal system and the bevel down, in this case, we're using peristaltic vacuum. As you look at the right-hand screen, we see aspiration at the top, vacuum is the middle, and power is at the bottom. Now, this is a pretty dense cataract, so we're going to 40% uh, percent power without a lot of effort. We're pretty much through the back plate. Now, not entirely. There may still be a little, little bit at the point of the clover leaf that connects it. Nope, there really wasn't. Um, and so we're going to take out the second quadrant. Now, you're about to see one of the magic features of fusion fluidics, and that is the ability to switch between peristaltic and venturi vacuum on the fly. So here the last little fragment of the peristaltic half of the surgery is going to, to disappear into the lumen of the needle. And there, notice the aspiration graph just vanished. Why? Well, we switched over to venturi vacuum. So as you probably know, the only difference between peristaltic and venturi is whether or not we have vacuum that is live, as in venturi vacuum, which you're seeing here, 
or whether the vacuum is dependent upon achieving occlusion. The studies I've performed comparing various gauges of needles versus various bends of needles have demonstrated that Venturi vacuum, when you're looking at the power used to remove a nuclear fragment, Venturi is much more efficient than peristaltic. You're actually getting more effect uh, with the power delivered at the needle if you're using Venturi vacuum than with peristaltic. And that's because Venturi is always live. You never have to reattain vacuum. That's uh, the patient giving me something to think about. She gave a nice cough there. Now, one of the other beauties about uh, transversal ultrasound is the absolute fluidity uh, with which things occur. The movement of the needle side to side, I believe, actually prevents a true 100% occlusion. And as a result, never get a post-occlusion surge. Uh, now, I'm using the, basically the needle tip and the second instrument to keep the uh, fragment from going forward in the eye. And with that, it basically disappeared. So we only have a couple little stray fragments to clean up, and we're almost done with removing this cataract. So the next step is, of course, cortical removal. I cheat. Um, I use a little J cannula, and this is a nice little technique I've done for the past 20 years that just basically power washes the posterior capsule. So what you see is the cortex that you weren't able to visualize out at the equator of the lens being dispersed into the center. Now, I really feel a lot more comfortable pushing it out of the fornices than I do sticking an INA handpiece into the fornices. So here we're going to put a good cohesive viscoelastic helon into the posterior capsule. We're going to inflate it pretty well. And all I'm trying to do is create space for the placement of the single piece technus lens. Here's a little endocote. I love this step because as soon as you open the incision, a cohesive viscoelastic has the tendency to want to come out of the incision, whereas the dispersive plugs that incision. So as I'm engaging the incision with the tip of the injector cartridge, there really isn't any efflux of viscoelastic out of the eye. Now, if you're patient, you can put the, the technus all the way in the bag and uh, without any additional manipulation. Personally, I get the, the leading edge into the bag and then help it unfold by gently nudging the uh, haptics out into the fornices of the capsule. So we irrigate the viscoelastic out from behind the IOL, irrigate it out of the chamber angle, and then we're going to go ahead and remove what material is left with the automated INA. Now, I strongly prefer to use Venturi vacuum for INA because it gets all of the residual viscoelastic out of the eye. Um, it's the fact that you've got that live vacuum. I mean, viscoelastic is just not... Uh, thick enough to achieve an occlusion. So peristaltic vacuum, when you're, you're doing that for removal of, uh, peristaltic vacuum, when you're using that for removal of viscoelastic, doesn't work because you don't get the occlusion. Basically, you're using that low flow. In this case, we use Venturi vacuum. The eye did beautifully with the surgery. There was very little corneal edema on the fo day following surgery, and this patient was thrilled.